for Jesus. Don't be ashamed. Stands for Jesus. Claim His name. For He loved you on the rugged cross with arms held open wide. Stand for Jesus. He's standing by your side. God is looking for someone to fill an empty place. Live a life of holiness and defy the world's embrace To count all gain as loss for the glory of the cross A city on a hill for everyone to see Stand for Jesus, don't be ashamed Claim His name For He loved you on a rocky cross With arms held open wide Stand for Jesus He's standing by your side Stand for Jesus Stand for Jesus Thank you so much. I, I don't know about any of you guys, but I, I wanted to stand. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. One of my favorite uh, uh, types of music is the guitar and voice. Let's pray. Father. How about now? All right. We'll see how long that lasts. Turn that away. 
So here we are. We're, we're talking about Tina Turner. I know, it's church, right? But we're talking about Tina Turner and her song, What's Love Got to Do, Got to Do With It. And she reaches this part in her, uh, what good, in her song where uh, she says, What good is a heart when a heart can be broken? So we explored this topic. We started off with that. And uh, so we were, three points were made in the sermon. First point was, God meets people where they are. So must we. I gave the story of the Samaritan woman. God met her where she was at. Regardless of her lack of desire to meet God where he was at, he met her where she was at. I also gave the example that the world tells us that success and happiness and health are determined by your bank account balance. But I let you know that research shows over a 75-year study that the happiest and healthiest people are actually those people with good connections, with good relationships. And thirdly, I ended the sermon by indicating and giving a story of my wife's superior intelligence to mine where love is a choice. It's not a deposit and withdrawal system, but rather love simply put, is a choice. I indicated to you that I was going to talk about how the importance of love in a community. And see, while love is an individual choice, and it starts there, it's impossible for it to end there. So I want to tell you a story Picture, if you will, this January, myself, uh, coming from a rougher past, decided that, you know what, I got about two friends in the whole world. That's, that's good enough for me, or so I've thought. And I'm not very great at making connections. I'm a very impatient man. I've got several rough edges. And, and so I decided through a series of life events that I should really make an effort to make connections. So what I did is I uh, told my wife about it, and uh, she said, all right, let's do it. And so she said, do it right away, because she capitalized on my vulnerability, so to speak. So I did. So I, I, uh, I booked a, 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 a chalet at Big White, and then I went, okay, I got a place booked. I'm ready to go on my trip. And then I went, oh, yeah, this is supposed to be a, a guy trip. Who am I going to invite? So I searched through my really long list of friends, all two, and uh, called them up. One was my cousin, very similar backgrounds, and the other is my best friend from high school. So I called them up, and, and uh, my cousin Jeremy decided to come, and uh, my, my buddy Jonathan said, yeah, he'll meet us there. And, and luckily for him, the ski hill's just like a half-hour drive from Ona. My cousin hitched a ride with me, and off we went. So on this drive, my cousin begins to open up, and, and he's just recently a Christian man in the last few years, and, and he's, re- he's wrestling. He's wrestling and, and sharing about that, and we're just driving, and we're just connecting, and, and he's just opening up, and he's sharing all his vulnerabilities with me. And, and likewise, I'm sitting in a driver's seat, and, and it's about a 12-hour drive, and we just shared, and 12 hours went by like that. And so I thought, wow, that was great. That was a wonderful connection. It was a great experience. And we got to the ski hill, got up there, got all checked in. And then my buddy Jonathan showed up. And of course, the dynamics changed a little bit. And so uh, we hung out and, and uh, visited a bit. And uh, they were getting to know each other, my, my friends. And, and uh, then my uh, cousin John, or, uh, he says, you know what? Why don't I invite my friend Garth up tomorrow? He'll go skiing with us. So we slept that night. And first thing around morning, 11-ish. We got up and went skiing, and his buddy Garth came. And so we skied the slopes, and it was really foggy, and, and uh, down the hills we go, and, and uh, Garth was a maniac on a snowboard. And, and we get back to the, uh, to the suite, and, and, and here's four 30-something to 40-year-old men. And we just started to chat. Never met Garth other than maybe once before. Jonathan and Garth had never met each other before. And, I mean, when I say chat... We were chatting, not just about the weather, not just about the woes of our wives. We were really down heart chatting. And having met Garth for the first time, who now I call a friend, I could see that Garth had a past, and Garth could see that I had a past, and we 
across all four ways and see that each one of us had a past. And that, that jumbled mess just began to mesh with, with openness and vulnerability. And these 35 to 40-year-old men were just chatting and just talking about the deepness of, of their past, uh, anywhere from drug addiction to sexual abuse to all of it came out. And we just, we just connected on a level that, that doesn't really happen. So Gar spoke up and he said, wow, this was amazing. I really needed this. Garth went home that day. My best friend Jonathan and I and Jeremy continued to ski for another couple days. And, and a, a day later, you know, after this deep connection, uh, there we were, me, Jeremy, and Jonathan. We're all out on the slopes and we're going and, and we're at the top and, and uh, uh Jeremy says, okay, we're going to take, uh, I can't even remember what the run was, Holloway, Blue Diamond, we're going to take Holloway, Blue Diamond. And I, okay, we're going to take Holloway, Blue Diamond. And, and Jonathan skis up, yeah, yeah, okay, Holloway, Blue Diamond. So all three of us take off, and Jonathan goes that way, Jeremy goes that way, and I go that way. Now remember, I said I had some rough edges. I was instantly annoyed. I'm like, guys, we're, we're taking, we're, we're going down the Holloway, the Blue, Di- the blue Run, the Holloway. But everybody's going three different directions. So my impatience began to grow as I'm shouting across all the crowds of people, hey guys, over here. And then Jonathan was over here shouting, he's, no guys, it's over here. And then Jeremy would shout, no, guys, guys, it's over here. And, and <clears throat> the past Jerry began to boil inside. Because I, I like to keep things cohesive and planned and organized. And, and none of that was happening. And these men who I deeply love really got on my last nerve. Now Jonathan, having been my friend probably the longest, rolled up and, of course, we got GoPros on because we're like all-star skiers, right? That's not true. It's just to catch boats. But <laughs> so we got these GoPros on and I knew it was coming and so I, uh, I hit the little button on my GoPro and <laughs> shut off my camera because I didn't want any record of what was about to come out of my mouth. And out spewed the old Jerry. And I mean, there was swear words, and there was belittling, and there was, I just let it all out. And I just unleashed this wrath upon my one true good friend. And he's no, no wimp. He fought back. Was concerned about being right, and I was concerned about being organized. And we went at it there on the ski hill, and I'm sure it was quite a spectacle for some people to watch. <laughs> As my cousin Jeremy came up, he, he said, I just chose to be silent because I didn't want no part of that. <laughs> and so I went down, and, uh, and, I, and I, I, we ended up skiing the same direction, and it turns out that none of us were on the right path, and that the run we were going on was on the other side of the hill. <laughs> but we were all right, you know? We were all right in our own eyes. And what I realized is that love looks past our faults. Because you know what? My best friend and I are still best friends. There were some silent periods on the chairlift. There might have been a little awkward conversation about how it went down, his interpretation, my interpretation, and Jeremy's interpretation later. But what prevailed was the connection. I could be me in my worst and still be loved. The Bible says a perfect love casts out fear. Why did I turn my camera off? I turned my camera off because I knew something bad was about to come out of my mouth. And I would fear that anybody other than John would see that. And in turn that I would be rejected disconnected. A perfect love casts that out. See, love is a choice. It's the ability to look at someone and see past their faults. Scripture reading today said that love must be sincere. In order to have sincerity, there's a very important trait called humbleness. 
Can you be humble enough to show your true identity? You see, I think we do ourselves an injustice when we come to church each week. And when people ask us, how are you doing? I have yet to hear very many people out of the thousands of people that I've asked on a Sabbath day how they're doing tell me, oh, just horrible. Just horrible. Boy, do you got 10 minutes? I could tell you some things that are going on. Most people will tell you, oh, good. Things are good. Things are fine. But if you take a moment and you look past their words and you look into their eyes, into their body language, into their facial expressions, you'll see a desperation, a huge desire to actually open up and tell you how things really are. To let it all out. Ephesians 4.2 says, be completely humble and gentle. Hmm. Be patient. Hmm. Bearing with one another in love. Now my friend Jonathan has that ability. Truthfully, I have that ability, my friend Jonathan. And that is why we are connected. We look past all the filth and we see the heart. What if church was a place where those kind of connections could happen? That when we here, walked out of here knowing, truly knowing one another. So much so that we could look past the mistakes, the inconsistencies, the alter us. I can tell you that we would be more apt to serve the community. That when we did come across somebody, whether knocking on their door or seeing them in the office, we would be able to see past our judgments. That we would be able to see past our own fears of rejection and truly connect. We have this example by Jesus of vulnerability. Can you think of a more vulnerable thing to do than to give up your life and be crucified on the cross, naked, to be speared in the side, to have thorns and mockery and spit upon? Can you think about a more humble thing than to sit in the Garden of Gethsemane and pray a fervent prayer, asking that the burden be taken from you, but yet still bearing it, regardless of your own self-desires? Can you think of a more vulnerable person than who Jesus was. But yet we say we are Christians, which means Christ-like. I want you to ask yourself, are you that vulnerable? Are you that willing? Once we push past the vulnerability and we actually connect in true, genuine connection, once we are truly vulnerable, then we can truly connect. And once we truly connect, then we actually have power. Did you ever wonder why Jesus chose disciples? I mean, he could have gone it alone. He's the king of the universe. He speaks, it happens. But he didn't do that, did he? As soon as Jesus started his ministry, what did he do? He sought out disciples. He sought out connection. He met people where they were at and he made them part of his fold and he made a group of 12 and he didn't, he didn't just pick the good ones. No. No, in fact, he picked the guy, the very guy that would betray him. Can you think of a more vulnerable approach to life? Jesus did it knowing that the connection is important. He did it because he knew that there was strength, not just what he would impart to them, but what they imparted to him. Remember at the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, guys, guys, wake up. I need you. I need you to pray. Pray with fervency. He needed their connection. He needed their love. He needed to pull away from the crowds and go by himself and connect with God. And then he needed to go and connect 
with them. And he needed them to connect with one another, to cast aside who is greater amongst them, but to just truly connect. Science is telling us what I'm telling you, what Jesus already knew years and years ago. A qualitative researcher, Brene Brown, did six years of research for a totally different purpose than what she discovered. She discovered that in order to connect, We must have excruciating, she uses the term excruciating in her TED Talk, vulnerability. Because truthfully, it's downright scary and a little bit excruciating to reveal all of who I am to you. And you would agree that if you did that with me, it would be a little awkward too, wouldn't it? I remember the first time I opened up completely with my wife and told her all my deepest, darkest stuff. I was terrified, mortified. She loves me. I opened up many years ago. She's still with me. I can tell you it's not because of my bank account balance. She loves me, regardless of all my faults. The truth is, we all need to be that way. You see, if we're not really willing to get vulnerable with one another, then we're not really really willing to connect in a meaningful way. Brothers and sisters, it's simple. Once we truly unite and connect as a church, As Christians, not as Adventists, but as Christians, followers of Christ, first and foremost, never mind preconceived ideas, but in true genuineness, in true openness, then can our love truly be known. When we walk out and we knock on that door, people will begin to open up. They will tell you things you wish you never heard. They will spew it out because they know that they are in safe company. Because they know that they are on equal ground. We go out and we tell them everything that we have to offer. Truth is, Jerry has nothing to offer. God has everything to offer. I'm no better than they are. The light that I have is not my own light. It's His light. If He chooses to make it shine through me, praise the Lord. If He chooses to die in that moment, praise the Lord. That's His choice. It's not up to me to save people. It's up to me to connect with the Savior. It's up to me to choose love. But it's not up to me to choose for my son that he follows the Lord. It's up to Isaiah. It's not up to me to choose that Shekinah should follow the Lord. It's up to Shekinah. My job is to love. To love them no matter what they choose. To be vulnerable enough to know that everybody's struggle is real. Luke 6.35, I'm going to block through a whole bunch of verses here on love. Luke 6.35, don't even worry about trying to keep up because it's just going to blast through. I can give you a copy of this later. Luke 6.35, but love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High God, because He is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. He is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Romans 12, 9, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Hate what is evil. I don't know you guys, but I avoid the things I hate. I avoid the things I hate. 
hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Mark 12, 31, the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Romans 13, 10, love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. All that you do must come from love. Not from control. Not from a savior complex. But from love. Can you love them where they are at? Hmm. To further this scripture, Romans 13, verse 8, starts out by saying, Owe no one anything. Owe them nothing. Owe no one anything except, except one thing, to love one another. We owe it to each other. It's the one thing God says you owe to one another, to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall keep the seventh day Sabbath. You shall not cut. And if there are any other commandments, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. 1 Corinthians 13, 4, 8. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not about getting numbers so I can say that I have baptized 10 people. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. But love never ceases. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And now these three remain. These three things remain. Faith. Hope and love. But the greatest of these is love. Mm. Ephesians 4 2 Be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. 1 Peter 4 8 Above all, love each other deeply, not surface, deeply. If you're going to love me deeply, you should at least know my middle name. Hey? Oh, I love you, brother. I I see where you're going wrong. I'm telling you, you got to go this direction, brother. I'm telling you, you're lost. You were up there preaching the other day, and and I didn't like it. You're lost. Sister, brother, what's my middle name? Oh, uh, 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 uh. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Dear friends, let us love one another. Love God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Amen? Amen. This is good news. We don't have to fear love. God is love. Y'all looking at me like, oh my, you're asking me to do a lot. I'm asking you to love. I'm asking you to connect with God. It's okay. The world tells us it's not. Tina Turner says, what good is a heart if a heart can be broken? I'm telling you, God gave you that heart. It's good. What's love got to do? Got to do with it? Everything. Everything, Tina. Everything. This world will tell you it has nothing. Donald Trump will tell you that's ridiculous. Hillary Clinton will say, love is that mamby-pamby thing. God tells us love has everything to do with everything. Mm. 
1 John 14, 18, 19. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives fear. Fear equals disconnection. Fear equals disconnection. Perfect love casts disconnection out. Was Jesus disconnected? Was he? Was he disconnected? I can't think of a more connected man. Can't think of one. He walked in the room. He walked to a, a new town place. Everybody knew Jesus. They knew him before they knew him. Fear equals disconnection. Because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. John 15, 13. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. Now we always think, oh, I could do that. Mm-hmm. I could do that. I could, I got, yeah, I could see a guy drowning. I could go out there and swim. I'll tell you. Out of the three or four times that I've seen people near death, and about 20 to 30 people standing around watching, very few to zero people react. But maybe we're just not talking about the physical death. Maybe we're talking about laying ourselves down, putting our fear and anxiety aside, and dying to self, and just laying that down to love someone, laying down our judgments. Get ready, husbands. Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, love your wives. Now, we're going to change that a bit. We're going to say wife in today's world, right? If you guys are loving your wives, uh, we got, you're going to have some issues. Love your wife, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Ephesians 5.33. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself. I know a lot of men that have a real problem with this. They spend more time doing man things, hunting, fishing, watching hockey, Facebooking, than they do connecting with their wives because it fulfills a selfish desire. Likewise, I've seen a lot of wives who love shopping, socializing, more than spending time with their husbands. But my Bible tells me that we must love each other wholeheartedly. Each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Now this flips both ways. Colossians 3, verse 14, And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. I'm telling you, if you're in a church board meeting, if you're in a CYC meeting, if you're in a marital conversation, a premarital conversation, and there is disunity, you better check your love factor. You better see who you're putting first. You better ask yourself, what's love got to do, got to do with it? Everything. Everything. Proverbs 10, 12. Or sorry, yes, 10, 12. Hatred stirs up conflict, but love covers over all wrongs. Oh, no, it doesn't. It just covers over some of them. He cheated on me. She cheated on me. Love don't cover that up. Now, I know it's not as simple and as clear-cut as I'm presenting today. But my Bible tells me that hatred stirs up conflict, but love covers over all wrongs. Some of you guys are walking around here with a big bag full of wrongs. Oh, my husband, he did this 2010, December 15th. He did it. He did it. He totally ignored me. Some of you men, oh, she went out there. She did this. 2009, I got it. And your bag is full of all that stuff. 
full of it, and it's weighing you down. You guys try to come in for a hug, that whole bag, just boonk, boonk. You can't even get close anymore. You got this big buffer of hatred, all the the, the, the wrongs. Love covers those up. It gets rid of them. Stop carrying them. Stop wearing them up front. Stop pulling them out every time they get on your nerves. One of the things I love about children is they're the quickest to forgive you. I have done some real screwed up things parenting. But man, my kids look right past it. I'm not their dad. I'm their hero. I'm their daddy. They open up. They love me. They look right past it. It don't take them a year. It don't take them six months. It don't take them deep counseling. There's something about little children that's amazing. 1 John 3, 16, 18 This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother or sister in need, it's like this brother said today, then maybe we got to pay his rent. Maybe it's not about telling him that Jesus is the answer. Maybe it's about saying, I got a friend who loves me enough that's going to look after me. I'll give you my last dollar. Your rent's paid. Jesus got mine looked after. but has no pity on them. So if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? That's the world today. Turn a blind eye. Walk away. Pretend like it's not here. They chose that. That's their problem. Not mine. Hmm. Should have bought a better washer if you can't afford a new one. Maybe you should have, you know, not lived paycheck to paycheck. That is the mentality that drives us today. Me first, me first. Verse 18 says, dear children. That's you and I. That's not just my daughter and my son. That's you and I. Because we are children. It says, dear children, let us not love with words her speech. I'm telling you, as Adventists, we're really good at words and speech. Really good at talking about how much we love people. But we fail at actually doing it. If this church burned down tomorrow, do you think that the Grand Prairie community would raise the funds to rebuild it? Do you think, other than the Daily Herald write-up that it burnt down, there would be an outcry from this community of a great loss? No. Because we lack at giving the one thing people need the most. A love in action. They don't hear our words. I checked the YouTube hits on our sermons. It ain't thousands. Grand Prairie doesn't stop at night and say, what happened at Grand Prairie SDA Church today? I missed out. We should be so actively involved that if this place burned down, if we lost, the community lost. That the community lost something. Not just us. We are a community But we're a nucleus. We're a small little group in a great big community. And our impact could be outrageously amazing. So much so that if it did burn down, there would be an outcry. There would be people lining up. There would be builders standing at the very entrance waiting to rebuild it, waiting to offer back. Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, 
but with actions and in truth. Now I want to point out something here in this verse. It says, with actions first. Emphasizing actions are more important than just the truth. If you run around and you keep hitting people over the head with truth, but you don't actually do anything for them, they're not hearing it. Put your speech aside. And let's get active. Let's get unified. On the contrary side, whoever does not love does not know God. Because God is love. Don't answer this out loud, but ask yourself, do you love? Do you know God? Let's pray. Lord God, you are a vulnerable, powerful, amazing God. You came and left all on the table for us so that we could, could ever be reminded for eternity of how beautiful and wonderful you are. And turn to you in every corner, in every weakness. Bless us, Lord. Give us this faith, this hope, and this love. Let them be our forefront. Let them be everything about us. Thank you, Jesus, for the opportunity to connect with you. Bless us in our connection together as a church. Bless our women's ministry. Bless our men's ministry. Bless our small groups. Bless our week of prayer, our prayer meetings each week. But bless us as one whole unified body. Help us to see past our faults, our failures, our shortcomings, and see the heart that beats within. Let us set our judgments aside. Let us no longer be susceptible to the idea that we save people, but recognize that you do. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me. Bless us each one. Amen.